Tonight, we're very excited to be presenting Heather Doubledam, who's a local architect, and I'm going to give you her bio in a minute. But first, I would like to acknowledge all of the sponsors that make this lecture series possible. So we have been very generously funded by this Canadian Institute for Steel Construction, Toronto Society of Architects, Thames Valley Brickworks, RAIC, OAA, the Consulate of the Netherlands, and the Consulate of France. And tonight, we've been specially sponsored by the Toronto Society of Architects and Thames Valley Brickworks. So now for, for Heather. So Heather Doubledam is a Toronto-based architect and designer who comes by her professional passion for architectural architecture honestly. As a fourth-generation architect, she carries on her modernist approach of her Dutch lineage. Heather is the principal of Doubledam Architecture and Design, a multidisciplinary studio committed to advancing an architectural and social agenda through built work and design research. Central to the practice is the exploration of contemporary architectural issues in which a desire to improve the public realm figures prominently, demonstrated not only by professional advocacy, but by to the projects undertaken by the studio. Recognized by numerous awards for design excellence and practice, Double Dam's work has garnered wide recognition in, in local, national, and international publications. Double Dam is the recipient of the 2016 Professional Prix de Roman Architecture from the Canada Council. It's one of the oldest and most prestigious prizes in architecture created to recognizing outstanding achievement in Canadian architecture. This prize will support the firm's research project entitled The Next Green Innovation in Sustainable Housing, which entails travel to Scandinavia and Germany to study sustainable housing precedents and research for northern climates. Double Dam's broad areas of study include a focus on resiliency, responsive design, and innovative sustainable practices and systems design and systems, exploring how architects in these countries set new standards for sustainable buildings while developing a unique spatial and artistic architectural language in which energy efficiency and building design merge seamlessly. Having recently returned from her first trip to Denmark, Heather will be presenting her first pre -to -Rome, firm's pre to Rome research to date, so please welcome and joining, join, join me in welcoming Heather to the stage. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. Thanks so much, Jen, for the uh, introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. It's great to see so many faces. Uh, so we were invited to speak about our uh, Pre to Rome project, and this is actually one of the very first times I'm going to be presenting this research, and I have a lot of stuff to, to show you tonight. Some stuff, of it, some stuff is really exciting. Some stuff might uh, scare you a little bit. Uh, I'm going to um, basically describe the project, uh, tell you what we've learned so far, give you um, a bit of a background on what's happening over there and how it all started and how we plan to disseminate this research. Um, and then I'm going to wrap up with a few of our own projects that uh, uh, display some of the ideas. Some of the uh, projects are ones that we completed prior to doing this research, and other ones are ones that have been informed by the research that we've done. So, here we go. So, uh, as Jen mentioned, last year we were awarded the Professional Prix de Rome in Architecture, and uh, we're going to be studying innovation in sustainability through design. It started off as a study of innovative housing in these countries, but really it's transformed to something much more than that. Uh, the prize allows us to study firsthand innovative sustainable architecture, and we're planning to travel to Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Germany. Uh, these are countries that are relevant to the Canadian context as they have very similar climate to Canada. So we're planning to travel to those countries in separate research trips over the next two years. And our broad areas of study include a focus on resiliency, responsive design, and innovative sustainable approaches. We're exploring how architects in these countries set new standards for sustainable buildings. And as Jen mentioned, we believe that they're developing a unique spatial and artistic architectural language in which energy efficiency and design merge seamlessly. So sustainability is often viewed as a purely technical pursuit, but in reality, it's much more related to design than systems. 
Our research includes meeting with architects, tours of innovative sustainable buildings, meetings with green building councils and research institutions, and government organizations promoting design. We're planning to see building integrated photovoltaics, new developments in responsive or intelligent materials, uh, net zero energy homes, regenerative design, in these countries, innovation is a result of a commitment by the government to fund sustainable research. And this allows architects to um, raise the standards of the research that's happening in this area and develop new systems and products that can be introduced to the market rather than just engineers and scientists that are working with those groups. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that as well. So why is this project relevant or important and, and why is this significant to architects? Canada's population is rapidly increasing, as we know. It's anticipated to reach 43.8 million by 2036, which is an increase of 10 million in the next 20 years. The Greater Toronto Area is projected to be the fastest growing region in Canada, with the population expected to reach 9.4 million by 2041. Currently, it's around 6.4 million. So that means that one quarter of our country's population will be living in one city. So developers are responding with a vast number of high-rise condominiums and suburban developments in and around the, the larger Canadian cities. These forms of housing are not culturally or socially sustainable, and with a few exceptions, they're not very environmentally sustainable. Governments also commission different types of buildings to, to match the growth, to support the population growth, such as schools, community centers, and hospitals. These buildings need to be as sustainable as possible. We know that buildings consume 40% of the world's energy, and in larger cities they account for up to 80% of carbon emissions. So this is really about the future of our built environment and the opportunity to affect change in energy consumption and carbon emissions. This is also an opportunity for architects to play a leading role in this change, and it really starts here in school in terms of the values that you adopt for your future career. So the first part of our research focused on Denmark. This past June, my team and I visited Copenhagen, which is really the epicenter of what's happening in Scandinavia. We also visited Malmo in Sweden, which is right across the bridge that connects the countries, to see a series of housing developments that are setting new standards for sustainability. Every day we met with architects and they generously uh, gave us an overview of their work and tours of their buildings. We met with um, architecture and green building organizations and it was an intense and jam-packed trip. We got a really detailed overview of what's going on in the region. It was also incredibly inspiring and it made me realize how far we have to go in Canada and how much we could be doing here. We, uh, our goal is to bring this research back to Canada and disseminate it in several ways, like this talk I'm presenting tonight, and I'm also going to be presenting some of this research at Edit on Monday night. Uh, we've created a blog called The Next Screen, and we're sharing our research that way. Prior to travel, we're posting case studies, some of the buildings we're planning on visiting, and then as we're traveling, we're posting real-time some of the research that we're learning. We're also doing video interviews of the architects and videos of the tours that we're getting, so we're planning to put that material together and post that on the internet as well. Uh, we're hoping to share that with architects, government officials, the public, because if everyone starts demanding a more sustainable approach, then governments and developers will respond. Just in terms of context, Canada has six times the population of Denmark, but in a land area that's 232 times the size of Denmark. Toronto has a latitude of 44 degrees north, and Copenhagen is 55.6, so they're quite a bit further north. And these are the latest stats that we found on electricity consumption and cost. In 2013, Canadians consumed about 15,000 kilowatt hours uh, per year per capita, while the Danes consume less than half at 6,000 kilowatt hours per year per capita. So probably one of the main reasons that energy costs are a lot higher in Europe. In Canada, energy costs on average 10 cents per kilowatt hour, while in Denmark, they're over four times that amount. So this would be a real impetus for reducing energy usage in buildings, but in Canada, we know that electricity costs are increasing. Ten years ago, we didn't hear that much about Denmark, but now we hear a lot about their cycling culture and sustainability. 
Uh, we're hearing more about Danish architects and their work, and there's a number of Danish architects who are doing projects in Canada. Denmark is the land of bicycles and windmills. 40% of the population cycles to work year-round. They currently get close to 30% of their energy from wind power. 2011, the Danish government produced a plan for complete independence from oil, coal, and gas in the energy and transportation sectors by 2050. You may have heard of it. It's called Our Future Energy. They were concerned about the rising cost of imported fossil fuels and the impact on families and businesses and the future economic prosperity of the country. So they decided to become the first nation on earth to run completely on clean energy, including in transportation. This began uh, as a reaction to the oil crisis in the 1970s. At the time, they saw a future built on limited resources and dependent on imported energy. So they decided to change direction, become more energy efficient, invest in renewable energy, and modernize their industry and energy sectors. They started this process in the 1980s, and since then, Denmark's economy has grown by 80%, but their energy consumption has remained the same. And they turned the pursuit of green energy into a new economy, a green growth economy, creating new jobs, revenue from their expertise, and exporting of services in green energy. This is a slide from a document produced by the State of Green, who we met when we were there. It's a public-private partnership founded by the Danish government that is a portal to learn all about green energy and, and Denmark's leadership in this area. Well, they're well on their way to reaching this goal. In 2015, 28.6% of Denmark's energy was already coming from renewable sources. This is another slide from the State of Green presentation. Their electrical grid is connected to a regional framework of wind power backed by biomass. So you can see in that chart on the right how the clean energy breaks down. In case you're not familiar with biomass, it's the burning of natural materials such as wood pellets, wood chips, and straw to create heat and steam, which is converted to electricity. So it can be done locally within a building or remotely and then connected to an energy grid. There's also an increasing push on the development of biogas, which is made from the con controlled decomposition or burning of waste from crops or organic household waste, which helps to reduce environmental impact from the farming industry and human waste, specifically by reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases. So Denmark has the largest biogas plants in the world and they keep building more and bringing more online. Another thing that's making a significant impact on the reduction of energy use is district energy. So 97% of Copenhagen is heated by district energy, district heating. Is a, it's an underground hot water distribution system generated by the incineration of waste and it's connected to almost every residence and building in the city. So the zone in red is Copenhagen and spreads outside far beyond. Copenhagen. When we were there in June, there was a few cool nights where we had to turn on the heat, and the, the, whole, uh, the whole city is just connected to this network of hot water underground, and instead of turning on the heat in your house or your apartment, you just turn on one rad, and it just heats the room, so it's a much more efficient way of heating if you're only spending time, say, in a few rooms, you don't have to heat your whole house or your whole building. So this is an affordable and reliable form of heating. It's not affected by power outages or increases in the cost of gas. And pretty much every residence or business is connected. So when we were there, we saw these large pipes underground when the ground was open. Uh, basically, they're running all over underneath the city. Uh, does anyone recognize this building up here? Anybody? Any of the students? No? You've probably seen this project. It's the uh, new incineration plant on Amage Island in Copenhagen designed by Bjarke Engels Group, which they won by competition, which is interesting enough in itself that they have a competition for an incineration plant. Uh, this plant claims to be the cleanest building burning of its kind in the world that will double as a recreational space for the city. It was nearly finished when we were there. They didn't have the ski hill finished, but They've got this uh, artificial ski slope running down the roof and a climbing wall on the side of the building. Uh, and so it is going to burn the city's garbage to turn into hot water, which is connected to that district energy heating system. So Copenhagen itself is investing $472 million in a climate plan to become the first carbon neutral city by 2025. 
and this plant is part of that plan. And it's interesting just to kind of hear the thinking of, uh, of how, the, how they're approaching this. So there's, here's a quote from the mayor of Copenhagen about the plan. We can see that we have to invest a lot of money to reach the target, but we can also see that we can create a lot of new jobs with that huge investment. Copenhagen can be a green laboratory for developing and testing new green solutions. Canada uses district heating. A uh, number of cities have small district heating systems in their downtown cores. In Toronto, the new region park development is an example. Uh, they get uh, supplementary heating from district heating. Uh, in this case, it's powered by geothermal, uh, solar thermal, sewer heat recovery, and it's also cooled from, from light cooling. So how is this relevant to architecture, you may be asking yourself. This kind of change in Denmark or elsewhere happens in two ways through the production of sustainable renewable energy, but also in the reduction of energy use. This is where architecture comes in, through the design of energy efficient buildings. In order to support and encourage the design of sustainable buildings and create a platform for raising standards in Denmark, the Danish government developed an architecture policy in 2007. This is the third revision. Uh, it was developed in 2014 called Putting People First. It was developed by the Ministry of Culture in close cooperation between various government ministries and stakeholders. This is a really innovative piece of le legislative guidance and from a Canadian perspective, it's pretty earth shattering. And the Canadian government doesn't include architecture in any of their policies. Uh, even though buildings represent a huge growth area for our country and the government is the largest purchaser of products and services in Canada. The Danish architecture policy outlines 64 initiatives within government ministries. It covers such things as standards for architectural quality and design excellence, sustainable design, various initiatives for the role that architecture can play in society, about educating their youth about architecture, and there's a framework of funding for research by architects, the support of innovation in architecture, and also the support of young architecture firms. They acknowledge that there's a lot of innovation that can happen with the younger firms, and so there's a whole support network for helping new firms start up and pair them with more established firms to, to take on uh, more complex projects. It also highlights the important role of architecture in society and the understanding of the value of good architecture. And it describes how architecture can promote quality of life environmentally, socially, and culturally. Here's a few pages from the document. I'm going to read you a quote on design excellence, because this is something that we generally don't hear here in Canada, except maybe in school. Public construction development should continue to place major priority on the long-term economic gains of high architectural quality and not on the short-term financial gains that can be achieved if the owner compromises on demands for architectural quality. So we have different policies in Canada. Generally, government at all levels, municipal, provincial, and federal, has a mandate to hire the low bidder. We all know that this does not always result in the best quality or really quality architecture, really anything for that matter. And in terms of older buildings in Denmark, they first consider the complete building life cycle to determine whether a building should be recycled and energy renovated, or if it should be demolished and replaced by a low energy building. And interestingly, to achieve innovation, Denmark has actually relaxed building regulations after they ensure that the regulations on health and safety and sustainability and accessibility are met then they can start to relax some of the other regulations, which gives architects a bit more flexibility in the design and room to innovate. So the impetus of the architecture policy was inspired by the work of Jan Gale. You probably have read a little bit about his work. Uh, he's a Danish architect and urban design consultant who started writing and teaching about human-centered design in the mid-60s. This is before anyone was interested in talking about these ideas. That was the era of the car and expressways running through cities knocking down old neighborhoods. He published six books, starting with Life Between Buildings in 1971, and more recently, Cities for People, which was published in 2010. His writings have had a profound impact on public space and human-centered design in, in Denmark. It's had an impact on the design of buildings, on public spaces, including the change to some pedestrian-only spaces, and also the renovation of the inner harbors. This is an organization that uh, is very important for architecture in Denmark, and we met with them when we were on our trip and learned about some of their initiatives. 
Uh, Rail Dania is a private organization which supports philanthropic projects in the realm of architecture and planning only. It was established in 2000 following the sale of Rail Credit Denmark, a Danish public credit agency, and a fund of approximately 20 billion kroner, which is about 4 billion Canadian dollars, was put aside for philanthropic purposes. So their mission is to improve the quality of life for all by developing the built environment in a positive and sustainable way. This is an organization that sees itself as a change agent, working as a catalyst for change, initiating projects that address challenges facing the built environment in our society. They support projects in architecture and the built environment, and in the past have supported such projects as the creation of the Danish Architecture Centre in Copenhagen. You can see some of the other projects that they've initiated here. They also provide grants for architecture firms to support research and sustainability. Denmark's goal is to develop world-class private and public research institutions focusing on the built environment. So there's a number of architecture practices who operate government-funded research divisions within their practice. So there's so many innovative practices in, in Denmark, so I'm only going to touch on a few of them and show you a few of their projects and a cross-section of the buildings that we visited. So how many people are familiar with this firm? Raise your hands, people know this firm, right? 3XN, yeah, you're probably familiar with GXN. G stands for green. GXN supports the architecture side of the, arch of the practice through building research that's used in their projects. So they have a dedicated um, ecological design research uh, department. Then they focus on digital processes and innovative material solutions. So this allows for real-time advances in building science in collaboration with scientists and other specialists, such as programmers, psychologists, biologists, chemists, and horticulturalists, ensuring that advances include design and aesthetics and can be used on real buildings. So their work falls into three categories, applied science, new materials, and digital technologies. Oh, look at that. We're back. The, I think their most interesting work is in the uh, new materials. Uh, here are some of the photos we took at their office of some of the new materials they've developed, like special concretes, insulation, cladding systems, and textiles in architecture. GXN aims to be an independent green consultancy that's firmly rooted in design. All their projects are created through interdisciplinary collaborations. And actually, Kim Nielsen, the principal of 3XN, is speaking on Saturday at EDIT, if anybody's interested in going to hear about their work. They do a lot of really interesting work. They, um, they are going to be using their research to gain new commissions for the practice. It's been uh, a really great uh, partnership between the two. And this knowledge is applied to several different projects. Their research is also open source, which is super interesting. Through uh, publications, exhibitions, they're going to be bringing an exhibition on their work to Toronto in February or March. They're not sure yet, but they're trying to find a venue right now that was supposed to be part of edit, but they couldn't coordinate the funding in time. So look for that in, in uh, February or March. It's pretty fascinating what they're doing. They, um, they, uh, the quote from their website, sustainability is normally defined and measured using engineering metrics and codes. GXN strives to bring a more multifaceted architectural approach to these discussions. Here's a photo of their office. They have a, a set, set up their office in a really cool uh, historic Ken and boat shed, which is on the water. It's incredibly inspiring. It's filled with these huge models. So we got a tour of one of their buildings. This is the UN City Project in Copenhagen. It's the new home for the United Nations in Denmark, which was completed in 2013. It was designed to consolidate three different agencies of the UN in one building, who were previously spread throughout the city on a uniquely shaped lot. So it was designed with eight wings for the different agencies and a central atrium, which is a vertical circulation space. You can see that space right here. Uh, the form allows for max maximum natural light to each area in the building as well. You see all those little black squares on the roof right there? So those are solar panels. The, almost the entire roof is covered in photovoltaic panels. There's um, over 1,400 panels producing 300,000 kilowatt hours per year, which reduces the need for electricity from the grid for this very large office building. So that central core that I was mentioning right here, 
Uh, that's where everyone meets. It's like the heart of the building with a central curved stair and it has an overhead operable, operable skylights. You can see them right there. So they draw natural light deep in the interior and allow for natural ventilation in the core of the building. You can see the stair right here. It's, uh, it connects all the different levels, both vertically and horizontally through bridge, bridges that cross. Um, and what it does is kind of facilitates chance encounters between the agencies um, and uh, kind of uh, becomes the social center for the building. The elevators are kind of tucked out of the way so everybody takes the stairs. The design integrates many different sustainable systems, solar panels on the roof, rainwater collection for flushing toilets, and there's a number of other systems, but the two most interesting are the seawater cooling system, which is down here, and the um, uh, solar shading devices. So the interior is cooled by a system that draws cold seawater into the building, which almost entirely eliminates the need for electricity for cooling. This is in the basement of the building where we got to see these really large tubes that transport the cold sea water. There's about three million liters of water that are pumped through there every year. The other interesting system is the solar shading devices on the building exterior. They're made from perforated metal to let light filter in when they're closed. Uh, they automatically open and close to allow or block the sun, but they can also be uh, controlled by users of their uh, computers. This is the building facade at night. There's two angular roofs here that have green roofs on them. You can see the, the, the shading devices are mostly open. And this building uses 55% less energy than an office of a similar size in Denmark, which is already much lower than the rest of the world. So it's pretty remarkable. Another innovative architecture practice in Denmark is Henning Larsen. They're quite a large practice based in Copenhagen. They're known for designing the city's opera house. That's really how they made their name. They, uh, designing sustainable buildings is a very large part of what they do. They host up to 12 PhD students in their office doing research in the built environment, and they collaborate on projects, and they use the ongoing research to inform their buildings. They published this 192-page book about their process, projects, and their methods of sustainable design. Here are some of the pages from the book. There's a real emphasis on the importance of daylighting at all scales, the scale of architecture and the scale of urban planning. Uh, they have such limited natural light for a large part of the year, so they've developed a series of design approaches to try and amplify whatever natural light they have and make sure that it gets down to the lower areas of a building. Um, and there's also an, importance, uh, an emphasis on the importance of energy reduction at the early stages of the design phase to avoid technical solutions that are merely added on, which ends up costing a lot more. So they developed a design of a building using passive systems, which influence the form of the building and lead to rich architectural interpretations. But these needs to be formed in conjunction with research and knowledge. That's why they put together this whole book. And they need support from others, engineers and other specialists. So this is one of their projects. It's actually a really small project. Normally, their projects are much larger. But um, I wanted to show it to you because it's an interesting model. It's uh, called the Energy Flex House. It's the first energy neutral single family home in Denmark. Energy neutral means that it produces the same amount of energy every year that an average family uses. So its total energy consumption is zero kilowatt hours per year. The heating and electricity are provided mainly through photovoltaics and solar heating systems. It's actually two identical homes you can see up here beside each other. They were built in 2009 with the Danish Technological Institute in anticipation of Denmark's 2050 goals and to test energy efficiency and the development of innovative technologies in the construction industry. So one house is the laboratory that measures en the um, energy components, all the ones that they've installed in house, and the other is occupied by a family. It's also equipped with measuring devices. So it gives a more detailed view on how energy is used and distributed given the complex interplay between climate, buildings, energy services, and the inhabitants. Um, it's also used for testing new construction solutions and components. The systems are changed on a regular basis. They have usually around 11 or 12 different R&D projects at any one time. Energy modeling, intelligent uh, electricity, decentralized ventilation, solar shading. Actually, you may have heard that 
Uh, Henning Larson won the competition to design the 500,000 square foot Etobicoke Civic Center in Toronto earlier this year. They just found out a few months ago. So their scheme won based on several factors. Uh, environmental sustainability. The building is aiming for a net zero target, which is pretty incredible for a building of this size. And a human scaled approach. By dividing the relatively large program into multiple forms, it creates a more inviting and human scaled experience within and around the building. And also flexibility. The design of the interior and exterior public spaces enables a broad range and, si and uh, <clears throat> size of community activities. This is the BO01 development in Malmo in Sweden. It's just across the bridge from Copenhagen. We got a tour from the planner at the city who worked on this project. It was started in 2001 as a sustainable housing exhibition, and it's now used as a model for sustainable development. It's comprised of 600 homes, offices, and shops. They're all designed differently and at different scales, low rise, mid rise. And around the perimeter, there's taller structures that block the really strong harbor winds. It's uh, housing's arranged around uh, more of an or organic medieval morphology rather than a grid with connections to courtyards and public squares for residents to gather, store their bikes, uh, for children to play. One of the uh, goals of the development is that they wanted each resident to be able to see water from their house. So each house is connected to water even if it doesn't face the sea. There's streams, rainwater collection systems, canals, ponds, and fountains found throughout in all the little courtyards. And garbage is collected um, around the perimeter of the site and burned for biogas. So residents deposit garbage into chutes. You can see them right here. And it's transferred to the perimeter for pickup location by trucks, so they don't have to have trucks driving in to the center of the development. It's all transferred to the perimeter. Uh, there was also a standard for very high architectural quality, and every building is unique and designed by different architects. This is another very interesting development in Copenhagen called Sluisholmen. It's more recent. It was completed in 2008. The, the Danish architecture firm Architema did the master plan with the Dutch architect Seward Suters. Uh, and they were inspired by Amsterdam's canals, but this is unique in uh, Danish housing construction. They developed uh, eight artificial islands with canals in between, and there's a total of 1,000 dwellings in five to seven story residential structures. They're designed both around water, roads, and courtyards. So water is the essential element in this community. Copenhagen is very connected to the water. People live on the water. There's a lot of leisure activities. So each dwelling has two faces, one on the water and one on land. You can see the small roads coming in here. And there's uh, parking garages underneath uh, every one of the developments. So people come and park underneath, and they can um, go up to their unit. And large interior courtyards uh, between everyone uh, in the middle of every island, which allows families to enjoy outdoor life. It's almost like their front yard and their backyard is the water. The courtyards have green space, shared vegetable gardens, and shared amenities such as barbecues and storage sheds. Uh, the master plan and housing layouts were done by Architema, but 25 different architecture firms were invited to design the rest of the buildings, including the facades. So each block features the work of at least five different firms. So you're getting some nice, interesting architectural quality there. So this is an older neighborhood in Copenhagen called St. Kelds. Uh, it has many paved courtyards, public squares, and circular intersections. And after a billion dollars in damages from a cloudburst a few years earlier, St. Kelts was designated as a climate change neighborhood. Um, the city held a competition for replanning. The Danish cities are especially susceptible to flooding, being so low-lying. And this is a problem that we're starting to have in Toronto now with all the new development, all the new paving. We've had a few cloud bursts of our own, not this past summer, but in previous summers. And, and we've seen a bit of flooding that uh, is fairly new. And it's only going to get worse here, too. So after the damage, the city reviewed two options for rainwater management. One was an improved sewer system, and the other was a green natural means of water diversion. So the green option was actually more economical, 
and created opportunity for more interesting public spaces. So the master plan was completed by Treya Natur, a young architect of practice in Copenhagen that also does planning. The challenge was to redirect or retain the water in the event of another flood using only landscape design. So they created storm retention ponds that are hills and play areas. You can see them down here. And the, during a heavy rainfall, they retain the water until it has a chance to absorb into the ground. This is a typical road in that neighborhood. So many of the asphalt uh, roads and sidewalks are being replaced with permeable pavers, softscaping and permeable walking paths. The water is directed below grade and then out, diverted out to the harbor. So one of the things that we learned on this trip, uh, we were there to study environmental sustainability, is that that's really a given for architects in Denmark now. The industry is so highly regulated, building codes are so strict, and architects design with environmental sustainability as a matter of course. So we learned that they're now focusing more on cultural and social sustainability. So we sort of try to interpret what they mean by social and cultural sustainability. Um, it's, I guess social sustainability is designed by a few different, th defined by a few different things like inclusion for people, uh, children, families, aging populations, people with disabilities, people from different cultures. Inclusion also means making architecture accessible both physically and mentally so that people are engaged in planning processes and they understand the values that we're trying to promote. Cultural sustainability is about longevity and adaptability, spaces for people to grow into, spaces that can be used for different purposes down the road instead of demolishing buildings. This is long-term thinking on how people live and trying to future-proof. So this is a Moose Home Resort. It's a sports center and resort on the west side of Zealand, and it's designed by art architects and completed in 2015. It was funded by Denmark's Muscular Dist Dystrophy Foundation, and it's a resort facility for people with physical disabilities and their families. Uh, there's, a, there's several multi-purpose halls, uh, athletic courts, and there's an experience ramp which wraps around the circular form of the hall and allows people with disabilities to participate in physical activities meant for wheelchairs. Uh, there's 24 different holiday homes equipped with machinery for physical assistance, and they all have scenic views towards the countryside and the landscape. So this is really social inclusion for everyone, regardless of your capability, in a fully accessible environment. I'm sure you know this residential development, the mountain by Plot, who's the predecessor firm to Big. Uh, it's one of their first projects built in 2008. It's 80 units located in Orsted, which is a suburban area south of Copenhagen, built in the 1990s for their growing population. It's basically a social experiment that was very effective, a model for collective living that could really be used in, in any country. It's a single building for living and parking. The step form gives each unit access to light and air, the top, and conceals a large parking structure underneath. The, uh, the parking area is connected to the street so residents can drive right up and park outside their units. And it's the only building in the region that, that, uh, that you can do that, where you can do that. Each unit has access to a private outdoor space with a view and a garden, similar to a suburban backyard, a little bit smaller, but with the social intensity of an urban building. There's large glass windows and doors that lead out onto terraces, and the terraces are separated from each other and the levels below by planters. So you can see in this photo here, right after uh, the building was built, they're just starting to grow, but this is a recent photo that we took in June, it's completely overgrown. The, um, in a good way, looks really good. The, uh, the whole thing is supported by uh, rainwater collection that irrigates the planters, so they don't have to worry about the plants dying. And we know this project so well. I mean, we, we, we saw it when it came out in the blogs. Um, everybody was fascinated by the form, but I think that it's a model for mid-rise development that we're not thinking about enough, that something that could be applied to, to Toronto or elsewhere in Canada. Um, it's a socially sustainable long-term alternative to the single-family home, something that we need to start taking pretty seriously in Canada. This is another project by BIG completed two years later in 2010, 
And the reason I'm showing this is that it was recently shortlisted as one of four projects for the REIC Moriyama International Prize, which celebrates humanistic values in a single building. Values of inclusion, accessibility, social and environmental sustainability. They didn't actually win, win but Kaiyua Bergman of uh, BIG, he's sort of number two to BRK, did a presentation on the project and the impact that it's had on other developments in Copenhagen and Denmark. This is actually Denmark's largest development to date. There's 475 units at different, of different sizes for individuals, retired couples, families. Uh, there's commercial and retail at grade and at the lower levels. And there's communal facilities in the middle of the building where the two loops meet. And they have large sheltered courtyards in the center between the loops. There's a continuous ramp that runs from the ground level up to the 10th floor, allowing public access to all levels of the building. And in terms of scale, this is a similar size development in Toronto. The corner of Peter and Adelaide has 472 units over 40 stories, so it gives you an idea of scale. So there's a cafe at the ground. This is actually an older photo, but this was bustling when we were there. There's people, you know, kids and strollers and bikes and a lot of people standing around outside. And two sloping green roofs. Uh, there's 18,000 square feet of green roofs that are irrigated through a stormwater management system. And the ramp leads up to the individual units. There's also a staircase that leads to the upper level of those units with a little tiny terrace at the top, a little private terrace. This is, um, let me go back two slides and show you. This is where we started. That photo was taken down here. And you go up the ramp here and through an opening underneath the building and around through another opening here around, there's another opening, and then you can go this way, that way, that way. So it's um, every, every one of these units has its own front yard on a street. So it's almost like you're at grade, uh, but really you're you know, four, six, eight, ten stories up. Um, and it makes people feel like they're part of a, a community rather than being a unit in a condominium and having to go down a dark corridor from the elevator to your unit to a glass wall. So there's uh, an incredible sort of social sustainability here where people can live there for a long time. Uh, the, the back of the units also have, uh, wait, go back one have um, balconies and windows so you get uh, through light. You have light on the front, which is sort of like your front yard, and then windows at the back. So this is another view from the center up the ramp. They're actually um, not welcoming visitors as much anymore because they've had a real influx of architectural tourism coming to see this building. There'll be a three or four large tourist buses that pull up and all these people will come out and start walking up the ramp. And so these people kind of feel like they're being invaded by all these architects from all over the place and other people who are interested in the development. So it's, it's kind of a, one of the problems of the success. So there's so many different unique views and, and every, the form really allows every unit to receive sunlight and fresh air while feeling like they're at grade. So uh, I guess you're probably wondering why I'm showing these older projects, but I think that um, beyond their architectural bravery, which we admired at the time, they're such an mo amazing model for social sustainability, allowing communal living in a very healthy way, unlike this, these towers that we're building in Canada. So back to reality. <laughs> now, there's some interesting projects happening in Canada too, but we have a lot to learn from the Danes. I'm going to show you six of our projects that embody some of this thinking and research and sustainable approaches. Uh, the projects span the country. Four of them are in Toronto. One of them is just west of Toronto, and one is near Whitehorse. So this is a small house within a heritage district that we designed, so we couldn't change the front of the house. And it, it's a common challenge that we face with uh, older houses in older neighborhoods in Toronto. Uh, they're quite small houses and small lots. This one was only 1,400 square feet. And so we need to find ways to make them feel larger without expanding footprints, because we still need to have green space. 
So many of these older homes also need to be updated for modern living. They're usually cut up into small rooms, you know, these old Victorian houses, and also increase energy efficiency. Most of the houses from this period don't have any insulation. They have single glazed windows, really old um, mechanical systems. So they, they require a complete overhaul. So this project we call Through House, that was our nickname, because the intent was to connect the interior to the exterior and give a feeling of moving through. Uh, we're trying to create a powerful visual connection to the outdoors, which makes the backyard uh, feel like it's part of the living space and physically and visually connect the living space. So we have large windows at the rear. We used a continuity of materials from inside to out. You can see the same material is used in the floor inside and outside, which kind of blurs the boundaries between inside and out. Uh, and also, we were trying to make the backyard into a livable space that could be used for a large part of the year. So we, we often do the uh, landscape design for our residential projects, just for that kind of continuity of design through the whole project. We um, try to create the feeling of kind of rooms within a larger space by these planters that were inset into the ground, um, and also use uh, plants and uh, you know trees and shrubs that have visual interest year round. So it's not a whole bunch of dead stuff in the backyard in the winter time. And this fireplace is actually made of um, strips of industrial felt that were remnants. Um, the artist um, Catherine Walter from Felt Studio did this for us. She had all these left over from another project, and so everyone thinks that's actually stone, and they go over and touch it, and it's it's soft. So we raise the plane of the backyard up. Um, there's some steps at the side here, so this whole thing is at one level. Create a little terrace, a deck with those sunken planters. And we have an overhead steel and wood trellis here that creates a feeling of an outdoor room. It's like a transition from inside to outside, like a halfway space. It's used to screen the sun in the summer, but allows the low winter sun to enter the space. So you can see right here, screening more than half of the sun that's trying to come in the glass doors and keep it cooler. We opened up the ground floor and created this sort of central light and air shaft in the middle, which is basically this stairwell with open riser stairs and a lot of translucent materials um, on the stair guards so that uh, the light can be brought deep into the interior because it's a semi-detached house. So long and narrow. And there's an operable skylight at the top of the stair, uh, which helps to vent the hot air out and uh, cool air comes in the lower level. So the owner actually doesn't use his air conditioning. He only does on a few really hot days in the summer, but he finds that the natural ventilation works really well uh, because of how the windows are placed. We used a lot of linear elements. I'm not sure if you're able to see in the slides, but the tiles have lines on them and they direct your eye outside. The millwork is a rift cut white oak, white oak, and you can see all the millwork has kind of linearity to it that helps direct the eye outside. The um, dining room, uh, the, the kitchen counter turns into the dining room, which then kind of morphs outside and turns into a barbecue counter. So everything is sort of emphasizing that linearity. So this project was in downtown Toronto, and it was actually a project that got canceled during uh, the design phase because we had a real lack of support from the planning department. But we started off with a study of how collective housing, collective living could be more sustainable, exploring different building forms to bring outdoor access to different scales of living. So as cities are densifying, people want a single family house with a backyard, but it's uh, becoming increasingly unaffordable for people to buy a single family house. So we're, we have to find ways to make multifamily living more culturally and socially sustainable. This is a three story rooming house in a Toronto neighborhood. It was built in 1907 and it had a really nice scale and character. The owner wasn't sure if they should knock it down or renovate it, and we convinced them to keep the existing building and just renovate the interior. We wanted to repurpose the, the building shell because it has a nice brick detailing and a nice character. So the owner wanted to convert it back to apartments and add a fourth story. 
Um, it was extremely old and dated, tiny windows, no insulation, not very energy efficient. So we took the existing building and stripped off the outdated balconies and the awning. Um, we cut large openings into the side and carved out this uh, central entrance space. We added the fourth story here and then we kind of greened all those spaces. You can see we were, we were trying to create these, um, what we call inverted outdoor spaces. So they're outdoor spaces within the building form that are kind of neither inside or outside. They're outside, but they're inside the building. And uh, we kind of have a play on words. We call this invert, invert apartments. So inverted, but also ver being uh, French for green. So we're kind of greening the space a little bit. So we, we were trying to keep the scale of the neighborhood, so we set, whoop, going back. <laughs> we set the fourth floor back and put a green roof there. And any of the new elements have wood to try and kind of warm up because we painted the brick a light color and then created all these little gardens. You can see this rendering of one of the little outdoor spaces and there's a diagram here of kind of creating this indoor outdoor space making it a little bit more sustainable for, for families to have this little private outdoor space. This is a kind of rendering of the night view. Uh, and there's a three-story vertical slice which divides the center of the building, creates a more prominent shared entrance and uh, public circulation spaces and it's glazed on three levels. So just to draw natural light into the spaces. And then you can see the fourth floor which is set back a little bit. So we were basically trying to challenge our notions of house in the city center. So this was a competition. It's a lakefront residential development in Carcross of 50 single family dwellings. They're around 1,000 square feet each and uh, varied between one and two stories. It's on Bennett Lake in the Yukon. It's about an hour south of Whitehorse. It's actually a really challenging site because there's this really fine Aeolian sand, a lot of wind erosion, and they wanted to maintain the existing vegetation. And it was designed for a First Nations development company, so we wanted to try and bring in um, First Nations references in terms of how they use wood and the craft of using wood. The, uh, it's set on Bennett Lake, which has spectacular views of the mountains beyond. And you can see the site is actually right here along the beach. And Carcross has actually got the smallest desert in the world. Who knew? Uh, it's a mecca for outdoor enthusiasts relying on cruise ship tourism. So the population is only 300 of this town, but they see over 100,000 people coming through every year uh, on their way to Skagway for the Alaskan cruises. So these are the form of the structures and we started off by angling the roof for snow. We pushed back the facade to protect it from the wind and then pulled the roof over to, to further protect it. We carved out a little area on the side um, and uh, have some perforated elements there so that it would let light in. This is an outdoor uh, sheltered storage area for all of the things that people use, the kayaks and skis and snowboards and everything. And based on the sort of very sensitive site, the, the dwellings had to sit very lightly on the land. So we used concrete great beams and helical piers to, to stabilize them. So it almost looks like they're just floating on the land. This is a residential project that we recently completed. It's in Toronto. Um, it's another narrow lot, and it's actually an existing house. We decided to maintain the existing side walls, the brick walls, but reclad the front and the back. Uh, we wanted to sort of reference the traditional domestic scale and form of the neighboring houses, so we kept the, the peak roof. So it's floor-to-ceiling glass on the back, and there's large windows on the front. Um, but the, the whole neighborhood is shaded by trees, so it helps to minimize heat gain in the summer, but when the leaves are gone in the winter, it allows solar gain to help warm the house. The, um, the owners wanted um, outdoor living spaces on multiple levels to connect to nature. They have a 
place out in the country and they wanted their urban home to have that same feeling of being connected to nature. So this is the plan that's showing outdoor spaces on different levels at the ground plane and on the third floor we have these two outdoor spaces. Each of them has their own unique character and varying levels of privacy. This is the roof deck at the back on the third floor and they're open to the tree canopy which is beautiful up there. This is the master bedroom and it's connected to what we call the Sky Garden. We nicknamed the house Sky Garden, which uh, is basically a, an outdoor space which is open to the sky, wind, and the stars. Uh, they use it quite a bit, actually. So there's thermally treated wood on the walls here on the deck, and there's a little recessed planter here, and the vines are growing up. But you have a wonderful view of the treetops when you're out there. This is the front of the house. The dining room is right when you come in, which is sort of an unusual layout for the domestic realm. We also um, created this outdoor space in the front of the house for an outdoor dining room, which is basically private space in the public realm. So there's a guard that's about uh, shoulder height, so it allows people to eat out there and still have privacy from the street. So they're kind of reclaiming part of the public space for private. And this is a sliding wall that uh, closes off the vestibule in the wintertime. You can slide it across. It's an art wall. You can see here there's a little handle there, a little notch that you can use to slide it back and forth. This is a view of the rear of the house. And we also did the landscape design for this one as well. We raised up the deck off of the off of grate again to connect it to the ground plane and uh, give that feeling of extension of the interior space. This is a recent project, it's actually under construction right now. It's gonna be finished in end of January. It's a house for an urban farmer. Um, it's, it's actually an engineer who's passionate about urban farming. He doesn't do it by uh, profession, but he's a hobbyist, but he also invests in emerging uh, green technologies. So where we had kind of multiple aims for the house. It's a couple who work from home, so they wanted to find a way to uh, compartmentalize work and personal spaces, uh, as well as a home that they could age in place. So it had several unique requirements. They wanted a roof that would facilitate productive urban farming and a workspace on the third floor, a basement full of natural light for the lower workspace, and an array of sustainable systems to showcase green technologies and minimize energy use all within a you know, downtown neighborhood. So these are our initial sketches for the house. We're looking for ways to both maximize the um, solar gain for the planting, but also we were interested in trying to showcase what's happening in this house, this urban farming to passer buyers on the street who would get a glimpse of the, uh, what's growing up there and the owners working up there on the roof. So we explored different ways of doing that. Uh, in the end, we just angled the front for it, and I'll show you in the section. So the sort of typical the typology of the houses on the street, we stripped off the root to create a flat roof for the planters, and we carved this courtyard down through the center of the house to bring light deep into the interior. It's a little third floor, which is the uh, workspace for one of the owners, and there's a germination room where he starts all of his plants before he plants them outside. And we greened all those spaces and tilted the front and the back facades down to try and give that uh, view from the street and then kind of put all the different elements, all the planters and, and everything up there. Um, so you can see the, the front of the house. It's got a um, pre-grade wood cladding. It's a rain screen cladding system that uh, is great so that over time it um, looks kind of natural as it's shifting from wood color to gray instead of having that blotchy look when it's shifting. And we pulled out every second slat so that the air and light could move through here and so you could see through, see what was happening. Uh, this is a room that we were screening with the, the slats over and this section at the entrance is clad in a fiber cement panel with wood veneer on it so that it always stays that color, it'll be permanently that color so that the, you know, at the ground plane, at the human scale, you've got the, the warmth of the wood. And you can see the courtyard at the side here where the light comes down. These are the, the plans. And at the basement level, 
the courtyards dropped right down to the basement level. So one of the owners works here, that's her office, and she gets to look out into a little garden with all the light coming from above. And then as you move up the, the tree, there's a, we're hoping to plant a tree here. Uh, there's a few different species that will grow well in a shaded environment. And then on the roof are all the planters, and they're, it's a continuous ribbon of uh, planters. It starts off on one side being fairly orthogonal, and then the owner asked us for something more whimsical on the other side. So we developed these curves, and he's got a little mini orchard up there with uh, fruit-bearing trees. You can see the courtyard down the center, and there's different views through the space you can see through. It helps make this, this really long, narrow house feel much larger and bringing the light in. The, the courtyard has a screen on the side so that the neighbors can't see directly into the house, which helps to also to filter the light. You can see this sort of dappled light on the interior different times of year, and, and having the vegetation or a tree in the center really helps you kind of engage with the changing seasons and uh, always be aware of what's happening. You can also see what's happening up on the roof. And there's a whole host of sustainable systems that were integrated, um, both passive and active systems. Uh, so there's a, a geothermal system in the front yard, which is something that isn't very common in the city, but the owner really wanted to invest in all these advances, and there's four uh, boreholes drilled in the front that are about 250 feet deep with uh, geothermal loops that support a heating and cooling system that's done through the floor in the basement and then through the ceiling on the other levels. So there's radiant heating and cooling through the ceiling, which heats or cools the drywall, and then the whole thing kind of radiates to, to either heat or cool the house. Uh, there's an extensive rainwater collection system and a cistern in the back, and then all of that is uh, pumped back up to irrigate the, uh, the planters on the roof and in the courtyard. Uh, there's a, an ERV system for ventilation so that there's no uh, warm air in the winter just uh, exhausted outside. There's heat recovery through that system and a lot of passive and natural ventilation through the windows. They also um, really wanted to use triple glazing. There's very large windows, so there's triple glazing, and there's three low E coatings, which really cuts down um, heat loss and heat gain. And uh, the windows basically have an R value of just over nine, which is incredibly high for glass. And the backyard has extensive planting as well. This is more decorative planting, but there's a little bit of um, productive vegetables growing. So this is the last project I'm going to show you. It's another project that's on the books and on the boards. And uh, it's just starting the develop design development phase. So I thought I would explain a little bit about our process um, in terms of getting a site and a program and then how do you start this project? How do you go from absolutely nothing to a building? And this is something that you know, I'm sure you struggle with in school at the beginning, how do you take those first few steps? So I thought it might be interesting to show the process that we went through for this project. So we won this commission. It's the uh, Canadian Centre for Rural Creativity in Blythe, Ontario. Uh, it's about 45 minutes west of Stratford in Huron County. And uh, the CCRC is an education centre for the performing arts and textile arts. The program calls for a 200... 200 250-seat uh, multi-purpose theatre, performing arts studios, artist studios, textile studios, a gallery, a gift shop, music studios, a gym, and, and a little bit more. There's a lot of program. It's going to be completely sustainable. We're pursuing a LEED Gold rating. If this building was in the city, it would be able to achieve LEED Platinum because there's a lot of points that you can't access if you're in a rural location, uh, things that have to do with public transportation and the kind of density that you see when you're in the city. Uh, so this is the existing site. There was a, a school, an old school, that was being used as an office, and it's since, since then it's been torn down. So we start off the project with a program, a site, and inspiration from a number of different sources. This is a process that we start off with. I'm sure that you're familiar with bubble diagrams, trying to figure out how to organize the program. There's some large elements. There's also the courtyard and an outdoor space that was a really big part uh, that we wanted to try and figure out how to organize everything. 
And we took inspiration from a number of different sources. One of them was the land and the sort of uh, farming, the kind of linear nature of the fields and the geometry that you see when you're driving down these country roads and you see all these fields and all these lines. Uh, we took inspiration from the light in the country that uh, you have uh, more extended views than you do in the city, so you're getting interesting light and shadows different times of year. This is the local vernacular, the buildings um, in surrounding communities, and they use a lot of brick, but it's kind of a gray and buff colored brick rather than the red brick that we see in Toronto. So we study those precedents as well. And then we started sketching out building form and working with the ideas of linearity and connecting all the different programs um, in, the, in the building. We studied the volumes in 3D using Rhino, we used SketchUp, um, try and figure out how the massing would work. And at this stage, we're thinking about sustainability and how to get the most uh, amount of passive systems utilizing things like solar gain and natural ventilation and daylighting. We developed this plan, this is sort of a party plan of the building, and you can see the, the separate volumes. This is almost like the road or the spine that connects the different programs with the volumes, and it's, there's an extension of this through the landscape as well, so you're reading these kind of geometries. Uh, we study the kind of the movement of vehicles. This is a busier road, quieter one. Um, where that we think the main entrance should be, um, trying to maximize views and then the movements of the sun and how to utilize the sun or protect against the sun. So this is a diagram showing all the different uh, sustainable systems that we're going to be using. And a big part of that is this central spine I was mentioning. It's sort of like the element that brings in the light and air that is then circulated through the rest of the space, but it's also uh, the space where people meet. So it's like the social center. But we're going to use um, rainwater harvesting for irrigation. Um, we'd like to try and use it for um, toilets, gray water system, but that may or may not be possible with the budget. We've got a terrace. There's actually green roofs on a number of the different flat roofs. Um, there's actually a, a real a precedent of a lot of photovoltaics used in this region, um, and as well as geothermal. So we're, we're able to take advantage of that in the region. And cool roofs is a big part where you have uh, these large volumes and, and using cool roof materials. So here's some quick sketches we did at the beginning of that central space, and it's a double height space uh, with uh, clerestory windows at the side. You can kind of see them here. And uh, a bridge at the top that, again, connects the spaces vertically. We did a whole series of study models, kind of working out uh, the volumes, and this was a model that we presented to the community. It's like a concept model. It's not going to be glazed on the top, but this is kind of the the analogy of the kind of light in the air, the spine that connects everything. And we did a whole number of studies for the facade in terms of materials, how to combine some of the local materials. Um, we were trying to find a way to express the um, creative elements that are happening on the interior. And you can see in this rendering, this, this structure right here is going to house the FACTS program, Fashion, Arts, and Creative Textiles. And we were trying to um, use a reclaim material and kind of embody ideas of fabric and weaving and try and do that on a fairly tight budget. The, uh, these are two different tones of, of brick. And you can see that volume, that long spine with the, with the light coming in and the theater is just peeking in behind. Here's the central space. And, and uh, this is the entrance to the theater on this side, and there's a digital cafe here that they're hoping will um, connect all the different departments. They can come and meet and share a coffee and, and work on their laptops or whatever. And here is a rendering of the gardens in the back. There's going to be uh, community gardens. Uh, they're going to be growing vegetables. They're also looking at growing flax for using for weaving to make into fabrics. And you can see the theater, it's screened at the top uh, with a wood element, and then that double height space behind. This is the, an entrance um, 
from the from the parking and the side. So in closing, we're training to design buildings that will in most cases outlast all of us. What role can architects play beyond just the design of buildings? What are we interested in? We want to design exciting buildings. We also want to be involved in placemaking, help some, solve some of the world's problems, be respected, be consulted, and to deal with local problems. So there are a number of global challenges that architects can have an impact on. We should at least be leaders in the built environment. We need to make our buildings and cities more resilient and more future-proof. We need to work together to solve some of these global challenges. And we have a social responsibility. We're making buildings for people. So if we're interested in innovative design, we can our role can encompass all of those things. Thank you. <laughs> if anyone has any questions, I'll take questions, starting here. Not that we saw, they, um, there's a lot of farming, you know, Denmark has a lot of farming, um, so we actually didn't actually read or hear about, I'm sure there are, but we didn't see any when we were there. Any other questions? No? Oh, there. So that is a really big question. So um, Marshall asked about what would, what kind of shift do we need to see in Toronto to make housing, communal housing, more sustainable? So a big part of it is uh, land values, uh, how much it costs to buy land in Toronto, and based on that cost, how can you maximize the the footprint? The how how you can get the most amount of units in there? Uh, to be able to cover that cost to make profit. So uh, the, the, the most inexpensive way of doing that is just to kind of replicate the floor plates all the way up and go as tall as possible. So we have all these zoning bylaws in place that dictate the height of a certain lot, the height of buildings on that lot. And those in most areas range from like 12, 16, 18 stories. But uh, we see developers putting buildings on there that are, you know, 40, 50 stories. So. In my opinion, I think that we need to sort of make some really difficult decisions and that the planning departments in the city have to just stick to their official plan, which dictates the height for certain neighborhoods. And what will happen is that developers won't be able to build to the height that they want, so they'll find other ways. It will be like a painful process of transitioning over because of the land values, but then land values will probably start to drop. This is just, you know, blue sky thinking. But there, there I was at a symposium once, and there was a, a presentation on um, tall rise buildings. And one of the presenters said that, uh, based on the setbacks that you need from a lot, that you could get about the same size in a mid-rise building of around 16 stories that you could in a building that was closer to 40 in terms of the number of units. And in that case, you can usually get a central courtyard with light and air. So there's, there's different models for development. It's just that there's a lot of pressures on the city. Uh, there's a lot of development charges that make a lot of money from taller buildings. So there's all these different pressures and I think that uh, that we just need to start kind of lobbying for a different approach. How much is the potential population of the houses for a resident? Say that again? Housing the house for a resident, how much um that house without all of the really crazy sustainable systems would probably be, it's around 4,000 square feet, so it would probably be about 1.2 million. But uh, doing the geothermal system and then the kind of structure that you need to support all the gardens, um, the triple glazing, all those things that he added on really bumped up the cost. So I think it's closer to 2 million, to be honest with you. Um, 
this is someone who's investing in these technologies, so he's hoping to use his home as a showcase for other people, and you don't have to spend that much on a single family house. Uh, there are ways to do it in a, in a less expensive way using more passive systems, but this particular client really wanted to, to go crazy with, uh, with this house and use it kind of as a model. Uh, and then, of course, you can find another way of, of doing that. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.